I want to make this video here count. I don't want to play this straight at all with the queer content of Big Time Rush. You know how much I love looking back at these nostalgic shows for people. And honestly, we can't afford to hesitate with how many episodes I want to talk about today. When you go big time, you gotta go big time, am I right? I better just take my shot, shake it up, cause what have I got to lose? People know the kind of content that I make here, and I frequently make my own luck with the luck that I choose. This is the only life I've got, so I've gotta live it big time. I'm honestly really hoping that at least one person watching this got that whole reference, because the amount of effort to incorporate the theme song of Big Time Rush into my intro was, frankly, actually perfectly reasonable for how happy it made me to pull it off. Yeah, that's right. We are back into old school Nickelodeon. Back in the slime days, when YouTubers hung out on iCarly and said, Carly Shay? From iCarly, right? and pop sensations were doing the hard work to get their start before they got too big to care anymore about the show that gave them their start. The week where I was told Ariana would not be here at all, and that they would write around her absence this episode by having her character be locked in a box. Those were the glory days. The days when I was a young person and was able to watch Nickelodeon without having to explain to people that it was my special interest and that I'm doing it for a YouTube video, okay? It's, it's for my job, alright? It's not weird. And Big Time Rush was always one of the periphery ones for me. I knew of it, and I'd heard that musical intro so many damn times, but I never actually watched it. So, for me, and for you who might also not know, Big Time Rush is about a bunch of hockey players, pulled together by a Simon Cowell-esque music producer to create a boy band and take the musical world by storm, with the comedy being dependent on this sort of fish-out-of-water vibe that frankly underpinned most of Disney, Nickelodeon, and Cartoon Network selection of shows. Kids enjoy fish-out-of-water stories, what can you say? And this fictional boy band was played by a real boy band who were also brought together by Nickelodeon to coincide with the show based on them. Great, now what was the overall process like? Uh, how long ago was the audition? Yeah. And the process? <laughs> Grueling? A while ago, yeah, yeah. It really was capitalizing on the success of Hannah Montana, using the very similar method of interweaving reality and fiction together to make as much money as physically possible. And today, we're exploring not a trans episode, but an array of gender swap and cross-dressing episodes. Because I want to build a case for how this was so often present in children's media back in the day. So let's get into Season 1's Episode 8, Big Time Break. Oh, I should take this opportunity to mention the characters' names at least. So there's Kendall, James, Carlos, and Logan. Those are our main four guys, and I've already forgotten which ones are which. Look, I, I know that Logan is the one who cross-dresses far too much for a cis straight man who doesn't do drag, and I think that Logan is this one. It's, it's kind of like One Direction before they split up. When you could have pulled up a picture, told me the names of the guys, and I could not have told you which ones were which. I only know two of them now, Harry, because his music got really good after leaving, seriously, I like that new stuff a lot, and Zayn, because he blew up first and then made the blandest music of all time. Climb on <laughs> the other two, I think are called Louie and Niall and... Wait a... There's a... There's a third guy! Who's the third guy? Regardless, I could not tell you which one of these is which. I, I know one is a professional football player, and another one keeps dating older women, but I don't know where the names go where. What I am saying here is bland groups of guys are my name kryptonite, and Big Time Rush is no different. Anyway, 
we start the episode with it giving us the general theme for the narrative. A good convention followed by episodes for many, many decades. And the theme here is one of repetition and knowing. In the sense that the boy band know each other too well and have heard all the stories before and maybe they need to spend less time together to get some new ones. Then we get into the big thing that brings everyone to Big Time Rush, that classic, beautiful intro song. Just truly one of the best that Nickelodeon ever did. And the same joke from the intro continues into the episode. They and the people they work with, the producer and his assistant, hate them and wants to see less of them right now, and so they get a day off. Yet, every time they split up, they just end up back together again. Split up! <laughs> split up again! Finally though, they are able to each run off to do their own storylines, without the other guys backing them up. And we are following just one of these storylines, and you know what that should mean? Uh, Kendall? Bye. Uh, James? Uh, bye bye Carlos? Uh, actually, Carlos sticks around a little bit with Logan, so we, I guess, need to pay attention to him for a little bit longer at least. But Logan's the one that we care about and who comes up way too often in these cross-dressing stories. Because Logan, you see, wants to go to a math lecture by Phoebe Nashi. Um, because he's the nerd of the group. The one who's fascinated with all that learning shit and maths and school stuff. But he is also still a dude and likes women and Phoebe is a hot woman. So, you know, the straight agenda. Gorgeous math genius Phoebe Nashi. She combines my two favorite things, girls and math. I wonder if there is a correlation here too, between nerds and being the ones who get dressed up as women on kids TV or even adult TV. Like, Pop Culture Detective has a great video that I piggybacked on for my Big Bang Theory video about how the nerds on there are seen as less threatening than regular guys, and due to that, they're able to get away with horrific sexism disguised as comedy without it being taken as so bad. In that similar vein, I wonder if the non-threatening nature of nerds that obsession with mental pursuits, mental pursuits that do often get relegated to a sort of feminine nature, plays some part in the characters naturally falling into the feminine role of pretending to be a woman. Many shows play the game of men are strong, women are smart, and that's how they divide it up. But I would need more evidence at this point to say anything conclusive. Regardless, from these character moments, you get the vibe of all the guys. Kendall is thinks he's a cool guy, but is actually just kind of creepy a lot. James is beauty obsessed or narcissistic. Carlos is just stupid, I'm sorry, reckless. And Logan is a fucking dweeb. A classic TV move. Four characters defined by a singular trait that lets an audience easily latch onto them and see themselves reflected in one of the characters. I, I actually wonder, I wonder if we can... Perhaps we can. You know, we just might be able to overlay this with what I perceive as the gold standard of the format, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Let me see. Yeah, close enough. And to continue being off track, because that's my natural state of being, a state of being that adds at least 60% uh, runtime to these videos, all of the guys who run off to do their own storylines, and that we're supposed to be ignoring, but you know I can never truly ignore bland boy band guy number two. Well, one of these guys, Kendall, is attempting to flirt with a girl who has a boyfriend, and is clearly engaging in a very aggressive manner that is not just friendly, and is kind of messed up in how duplicitous it is. I could do this all day. Boyfriend! What I'm saying here is that the straight agenda is in full swing. Guys can't just do activities or hang out with women without there being some kind of relationship possibility or ulterior motive to that hangout. And I don't particularly like that vibe. A 
Especially because you know that if he was a gay guy and he was after a man, it would be considered by conservatives and censors to be injecting the agenda and converting the youth to g gayness. Buzz uh, Light yeah. has the gay kiss. I don't like an unnecessary sex scene in any movie. Guarantee you this gay kiss doesn't impact the story. And on the other side, Carlos is really trying to hunt down his helmet with his father. So... You know, I guess look out for the helmet agenda too while you're at it. His dad's actually a pretty aggressive cop who like tackles people for no reason and like pins them to walls. So it's more police violence, I guess. Dad? Back to our man Logan though. The one who is at least gonna slightly break this gendered mold by dressing as a girl for the episode and doing some queer adjacent shit. You know, we have to hope that's gonna happen anyway. Well, our man Logan finds out that he can't get to see Phoebe Nushy speak because her presentation is in an all-girls school and the security officer boots him out despite the fact that he has a ticket before proceeding to beat Logan with a cardboard cutout. Oh, well, let's find out. Now get out! Oh, 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 what are you doing? Jesus Christ, this show is really making American security forces look like the violent bastards that they are in real life. But also, sorry, what? I, I understand that we need to have this whole story happen so that all the queer and trans people in the audience can finally get a character in a dress so we get to feel feelings that hadn't cropped up before this Saturday morning tuning into Nickelodeon and are gonna raise a lot more questions about either gender or sexuality down the line. But why would a speaker host their event inside of a location that apparently has such stringent rules that it doesn't even allow certain guests onto the premises. Like, all girls schools do allow guys onto them. They often have exchange programs with neighboring all boys schools to share classes in the later years. And also, I would guess that some of the teachers are guys? Or the cleaning staff? Or well, probably somebody, right? <laughs> This is an all-girls school, no boys. I, I don't feel like it's legal for schools to refuse to hire one gender and also keep them off the premises entirely. Like, I don't think they have the authority to exclude like that. But on top of this, Logan got a ticket. If you're only gonna have your event in a place that lets only girls in, you shouldn't let guys buy tickets for it, or at least you need to reimburse them for what was clearly misleading information, as Logan was clearly not informed about this stringent security measure. But I have a ticket. Oh, well in that case, still not a girl. I suppose the alternative option here is that the security guard is the one taking this on themselves. Like this one security guard read all girls school and went, well, that must mean only girls, and has been kicking staff members and guests and visitors out of the building for weeks now, to a presumable tsunami of oncoming complaints and probable lawsuits. Logan, though, has a story here, and here we go with that story. He bursts into a room with his surrogate mother in it, Mrs. Knight, Kendall's mother, who is around for a lot of the episodes and is kind of protective of all the boys and involved in their stories while their actual parents are not there. So she just plays the generic parent role for everybody. And he bursts in and says this to this reaction. Man, I wish it was a girl. Oh, no, 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 yes. Now that is the kind of content that we came for. An acknowledgement of the existence of trans women and the shocked reaction of an older person to that perceived idea. And it is interesting in the way Logan just kind of recovers from it. Like he's clearly aware that this was the interpretation from Mrs. Knight and it's just like, oh, no, 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 sorry, Mrs. Knight. That's, that's not what I meant. I'm, I'm not trans. I want to be a girl so I can sneak into an all-girls school to see a speaker. It's not because of dysphoria or anything, all right? And it's kind of nice to have that acknowledgement that ultimately, while these cases of guys dressing up as girls and wanting to be girls for certain things and experiencing womanhood can be very helpful for gender transition journeys or for people getting a gender awakening, these are not the same as having a character be trans. 
They can be headcanoned like that, and I support it, and they can be seen as gender fucky for sure, which I also support, but ultimately, trans women don't transition to sneak into women's spaces for either nefarious or non-nefarious purposes. Trans women use women's spaces because they're women. Big Time Rush kind of gets all of that idea across in this simple line and delivery. Thank God while we're here that the parent figure is only shocked by this revelation, and not openly stating how they don't want it to be true, like happened in Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, which I also have a video on, maybe go check it out sometime. Mrs. Knight then does the face, while asking Logan how badly he wants to see Phoebe Nashi. The face that says, Oh, I'm about to cross-dress this bitch. While well, that same bloody musical sting happens again. How badly do you want to go to that lecture? Really bad. Well, where, where, where are all these kid shows getting the same template for their gender swap episodes from? It, it keeps happening so much. And I want to figure out who started this bloody trend. Does the script writing program they all use just have like a control V for gender swap episodes? Like, if you're talking to someone and lamenting a situation where you might need to go undercover or be a girl for it, watch out for that person to suddenly just go... Because they're about to do a gender flip on you. Awareness is half the battle to avoid being forced feminized. Watch yourself. This is the look that Mrs. Knight ends up going with for Logan, and... Um, ooh. You know, for a first attempt, not terrible, but it is certainly giving off a lot of vibes that Logan still hasn't quite found their fit yet. And I think this also continues that effeminate theme of the nerds with how Mrs. Knight says that Logan is the same size as her, that her clothes fit him so well. Yep, we're the same size. You know, there's a little joke here. A dig at Logan under that auspice of us laughing at the effemininity of this man. Which is not perfect for any guys who might be effeminate or who want to be effeminate to see this in a show, really. Also, to get massively distracted, the Kendall story here is insane. And I can't tell what the message they want us to get or learn is. Like, we find out that Joe, the girl who has a boyfriend that Kendall is trying to hit on regardless of that fact, is lying about having a boyfriend, specifically so she can focus on her career rather than boys, and Kendall's sister informs him of this, and then calls him a chump, not because he's been a creepy dude hitting on a girl with a boyfriend, but because he's been a creepy dude hitting on a girl who's lying about having a boyfriend. You are a chump. What, for going after a girl who has a boyfriend? No because you're going after a girl who's lying. Like, Kendall and Joe end up dating. I want you to be aware that this whole thing goes the way of she ends up with him anyways because she actually secretly likes him. And that's sort of fine, but personally, I don't think I would be okay with someone who keeps pursuing me despite my attempts to foist them off. Like, determination in relationships is a facet that guys have taken to extremely not okay levels, especially with the way that media and history have shown them how to do it. All those classic stories from the 1950s of guys with the old, Ah, you see, she said no, but I thought she was the nicest dame I ever did see, so I ignored her protestations and wore her down over the course of years and years, till finally we ended up married, and then she couldn't leave me. You see, these broads, they like to play hard to get, and it's your job as a man to be hard to throw off, yeah? That's my transatlantic voice attempt for any voice acting gigs out there. You can hire me at... Don't. Thankfully, we don't have to talk about the way that Kendall's sister is the one pushing him to take action against Joe for the lying slash fobbing. A frankly worrying development and statement to have a like young girl being like, hey, you have to do something about this or it's going to impact my view of you as a man. She's been playing me this whole time? Like a fiddle. What are you going to do about it, big brother? And remember, I look up to you. Because... Look, we're here to talk about the gender shit, baby, okay? You know, the like the transgender cross-dressing stuff. And this one seems like more gender politics than gender swap. So let me get back to Logan, alright? Let me let me dodge this bullet, please. 
Please let me avoid this bullet of talking about Kendall's long-term relationship and the shitty foundations it's built upon. Oh, okay, actually, wait, wait one second. Before we get back to Logan, I got to talk about this moment from James and Camille in another one of the side stories, where the two characters clearly go for a fist bump and whiff it. Like, I don't think this was intentional, but clearly they could not get another take so instead, what the editing team did was shove in a little weep noise to kind of make it seem deliberate and like these guys missed on intention rather than it being a fuck up. No. Nope. Then come on in. You know, just a fun little thing. Anyways, you know, enough of all that. What's happening with our boy Logan, am I right? Mrs. Knight is giving Logan the trial test of the gender outfit seeing if he can make it through the lobby of the hotel without any complications popping up. Because if he can do that, then he can do anything dressed as a girl. And initially, despite all my misgivings about the outfit and the makeup and the hair, like, dude, the dress isn't fitting your form. You, you, you gotta work around that, all right? Well, despite all that, some guys do hit on Logan and seem to be fooled by him until he talks. And then they're shocked because it's it's clearly at that point a, a guy in a dress. Make it into that girl's school. How's it going? Hey, chilling, you know, doing my thing. Bleep, blap. That's not what they signed up for, you know? <laughs> what a funny little moment, you know? That Those guys didn't come here for any of this, this gay or queer shit. These cis straight men, uh, presuming that they're cis and straight, because that's actually a pretty fair presumption um, that holds... Pretty true for most kids' shows characters back in the day. You know, the baseline was cis and straight, and a person needed to tell you otherwise for them to be treated differently, but you just know they absolutely would not tell you otherwise because everyone was cis and straight. There are probably some examples that do break with that. Mrs. Knight advises Logan to speak a little higher if he wants to pass, which... Yes, passing isn't a big deal for actual trans people, it, it's a bullshit metric by which we diminish the spectrum of gender presentation to fit binary modes of existence and appeal to cis people who are either gonna hate us or be okay with us no matter what we do, but in this particular case, passing does matter quite a bit for Logan, because he needs to get past a security guard. <laughs> If I had to get past security guards to be able to do anything I wanted in my life, I also might end up putting in more work to pass that I don't actually want to do. And I've just realised now that that is a scary reality that many American trans people have to face. Why can't I ever just do a fun little kid show video without the horrifying creeping in of systemic transphobia and bigotry that permeates the real world? Why can't we just have fun? Mrs. Knight is at least being supportive and giving advice. Not exactly in-depth advice or super helpful support, but she is here and she is pushing Logan into pulling this off, which is more than some people. Right. <clears throat> Now go. And he does make it through the lobby by talking to every single fucking person he can find in a falsetto voice. And while at the end of this, Logan does act as if this was a success because nobody called him out or stopped him, I guess, I would say that the reactions and the faces of the people were ones that were just not going to be pieces of shit and say anything about it to Logan anyways. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> like, they don't know what is going on here. All they see is this person walking around. A person in a clearly presenting female outfit, despite some perhaps masculine features, and they chose to not bring that up to a random stranger because doing that is a dick move. Just mind your own business, you know? What I am saying here is that none of what happened in this scene proves that the security guard is gonna be deceived by the men in a dress act to get into women's spaces. Ooh, I didn't like that line. I didn't like the sentiment of that statement at all there. Like, like I, I think that Logan should really be running this by people who know Logan and are being told that they should speak up 
if it isn't actually successfully tricking them. Mm, God, the narrative is a rough one in regards to the overarching theme that Men in a Dress represents, right? Like, so often these episodes are built on the premise that it's about lying to people to get something. And that does worryingly overlap with the conservative fear-mongering about what trans women are trying to do. Because to them, trans women and men in a dress is the same thing. Biological males to welcome men as men that a man that a man. And yet we just see Logan in the lecture room in the next scene. A lecture room that's clearly a classroom. Wait a minute, actually I'm confused. Is, is this meant to be a class taught by Fimina Shri or an event hosted by her? Because Logan had a ticket earlier, but surely if you have a ticket it should be held in some kind of event hall or something. Like, some of these people at the event have just study books. They don't have her book, they just have a book. Thank you, thank you. Anyway, all the women in the class are looking at Logan. Because possibly this disguise that isn't that good isn't working. But then again, also, it worked well enough to get past the super stringent guard. So, must be doing alright, or she's the T-Rex of gender. You know, she can't see you as long as you're wearing the right clothes for whatever gender she's trying to look for. The logic here is getting me a little lost, to be honest. Because the show is both pretending that Logan is passing, while also having some people react like Logan isn't passing. And Logan then says to one of the other girls about how gorgeous Phoebe is, to the record scratch and shock of all the other women, before he corrects himself to smart, to smart, not gorgeous, smart. So gorgeous. Smart? <laughs> I mean, she's really smart. Which is weird, because I get it, a guy objectifying a woman by reducing her to her appearance is bad. But also, women say to other women that women look good all the time. Like... That isn't a statement that would not be uttered by a woman. It's perfectly common for a woman to say, she looks gorgeous. And we then discover that maybe that security guard from earlier was actually just enacting Phoebe Nashi's own personal requests about no guys, because she kind of hates men a lot during her talking. A groundbreaking equation even though it was discovered by a boy. Boys are not as smart as girls. Like, she makes being anti-man a center part of her maths... lecture? Speech? Lesson? I, I still have no idea what she's setting up to do, because it feels like a school lesson based on everything happening around it. But then, why is she trapped by Logan and certain people in the class as this special guest that you have to buy tickets for? I'm thinking about this way more than the writers of Big Time Rush ever did. And maybe I should stop. But Phoebe is a misandrist. She's openly dismissing men as being inherently inferior in intelligence. Which sucks for Logan, because he's sitting here hearing a person that he has great respect for talk down something that he has made a big part of his identity, his being smart and liking maths, and she's saying that he isn't, and he's not even capable of it because he's a man. And, uh, oh, he's getting a gender-reversed version of, of what being a woman is like, right? Like, they have to deal with people putting them down because of who they are, and saying that they can't possibly do something, or understand something because they're a woman. They, uh, very fair statement, because some boys are very smart. I mean, maybe that's what it's going for. Maybe I'm reading too well into what Big Time Rush is doing and giving them way too much credit. It's also creepy that Phoebe is only saying this stuff because she is assured that there are no men in the audience. Like, as long as it's just women who she thinks agree with her, she'll say it. Logan tries to push back on this stuff, while also trying to keep up the disguise. And the fact that this conversation here is happening makes me realise that those looks Logan was getting from the other girls wasn't because those girls didn't think he was a girl. I was wrong. Those looks were because people in the classroom thought he was a weird-looking girl, I guess. Like, those were the bullying looks of mean girls that many cis women who don't fall into the perfect image of what a woman should be might be able to have some sympathy towards. Women can be very cruel to each other. And Logan then breaks disguise to reveal that at least one man understood Phoebe's math book and that her prejudice is wrong, I guess. But the point of this episode isn't about Prejudice being wrong, it's about all the girls standing up, 
pointing at Logan, shouting boy in unison, which is the creepiest cult shit I have ever seen and a reason for maybe the fact that the school needs to, I don't know, do some mixed gender lessons to try and break up whatever the fuck is happening to the women at this class. But they proceed to treat this guy in their class as something that deserves to be viciously attacked by 20 women for existing in their spaces. Whew. A lot of stuff going on here, huh? Also, thank you sound edit guys for putting cat noises over the women fighting Logan. Because we get it. Cat fights, women, scratching. Tropes are the bread and butter of lazy writers after all. <laughs> I also want to present this scene right here with no context. And that dog. <laughs> Moving on. All the guys come together at the end of the episode to tell each other the crazy stuff that happened to them while apart. The new stories that they've got. Like Carlos finding a kleptomaniac dog, or Kendall creeping on a girl and getting a date, or James getting an acting gig and letting it go to be nice to Camille. Or of course, our boy Logan, who got violently attacked by a bunch of women, waltzes on in through the door, dressed torn to shreds, and collapses to the floor, as everyone rushes over to try and help him up. Yeah, that old girls school heard the term boy band and said boy band? More like boys band, am I right? Kill this fucking man for being in your spaces and trying to listen to a woman talk about maths. And that's the episode. That's the episode? That wasn't a lot to go off of. Look, I don't think there was any grand narrative theme to the gender swap or cross-dressing story of Logan. There wasn't a message that I think was cohesively planned enough to honestly justify what happened. It really felt like the writers wanted a gender swap episode for the funnies, and they just kind of ran with whatever would let them do that. And while people might rightfully say that this is far away from a trans episode, I mean, they don't even say the word in the episode, they just hint at the idea of it near the beginning. And frankly, it's barely a gender swap episode, as Logan builds no real character for his female persona, just a dress and a high voice, no name like previous shows have done. While all that is true, by doing this big joke that points to a man in a dress as being funny and ridiculous and worth ridicule inherently, big time rush writers are adopting the attitudes that feed into transphobia, that endorse the bigotry faced by people who look like this or seem like this but are trans. Hey, chillin', you know. Men in dresses is one of those things that can be done well, that can be used as a fun experiment presentation with gender for male characters, yet it needs to be handled with care to avoid the stereotypes and messages that just enable shitty reactions to communities that are all lumped under this same big banner. But as mentioned, this isn't the end of the gender swap story for Big Time Rush. No, no, no. There are still three more episodes on my list of things to talk about, and at least two of those are about Logan himself again. So let's get into those before we start really getting into what Big Time Rush was trying to say overall here in their as close to trans as a narrative can get on Nickelodeon in the 2000s and 2010s. With all that said, it's time to move on to Season 2's Episode 10, Big Time Crush. Now, to alleviate some fears at that title quickly, no, the plot of this episode is not that one of the crushes turns out to actually be a trans woman slash guy in a dress, as they would probably have painted it back in the ancient days of 2011, because as I mentioned near the start of this, getting an actual trans person onto any kid's show from Nickelodeon or Disney or Cartoon Network was basically impossible. 
they might as well have just flat out not existed. And don't worry, I am going to eventually in a video in, um, I don't know, probably a few weeks time, talk about the Henry Danger sized elephant in the room for this conversation, but that statement about the non-existence of trans people, non-entity of trans lives, rings true. It doesn't mean that trans people didn't exist, or that there wasn't a trans community as some people like to pretend was the case, that we just cropped up magically in the past 10 years, it's just that cis propaganda to diminish our lives worked so well that we were relegated to a joke that people assumed didn't really happen, cause who would want to be that, right? You don't want to be that, you laugh at it, you mock it, you ridicule the idea, you don't live it. So no, we don't have to fear actual trans people getting any kind of direct flack here. But that doesn't mean that trans people can't catch stray bullets like in the previous episode. Cause well, the trans umbrella is quite a wide one, and the queer umbrella is even wider. And oftentimes a targeted joke or attack on one side of the community ends up rippling out to hurt many different people in ways that you wouldn't even believe or consider possible. There isn't a gender swap narrative to this new episode, there's merely a scene that caught my eye, so we're gonna hone in on that and I'll just give you the synopsis of the episode. Or at least I will try to do that and keep the tangents to a minimum. I am lying. So this episode is all about dating again. Jesus Christ, one track mind am I right? The straights sure are trying to convince kids about something over here. As the gang is trying to get Carlos a date, and they decide that the best way to facilitate that occurring is by having Carlos rescue an old lady from a burglar. Burglar? Burglar. Uh -oh. And seeing as Big Time Rush doesn't know any old ladies, or want to put any old ladies in danger, or maybe just because the writers have a thing for seeing Logan in drag, they decide to go with Logan dressing up as an old lady as part of the plan. Oh, I'm so old and frail, and look, my purse, it's just so full of money. And the plan goes horribly wrong, with Carlos punching Logan in the face. A thing that actually makes me kind of thankful that they didn't get some outside old lady involved in the process. Like, Jesus Christ, Carlos was just like punched out an 80 year old. I'll save you! Thank you also, not to get sucked into that gender politics stuff from the previous episode, but why was it so bad for Joe to lie about having a boyfriend for the purpose of keeping boys away? But it's totally fine for Carlos to lie and manipulate this chick that he likes to get her to think that he's a hero. I mean, we all know why it's the case. It starts with S and ends with hundreds and hundreds of years of systemic misogyny that paints male pursuit of women as noble even if it's deceptive, while women are shown to be liars in an underhanded vernal sense if they ever try to lie. Uh, wait, sorry, that wasn't a word, that was a mumbled sentence. What I meant to say was that it starts with S and ends with exism. Easier. And to judge Logan's fit here as an old lady, he actually wears the old woman outfit a hell of a lot better than the previous attempt at cross-dressing. Certainly playing a little bit more into his strengths, though I must say there is still very little commitment to the bit. And if I've learned anything from RuPaul's Drag Race, commitment is Everything, darling. If you want to serve without receiving shade or sashaying away, then you need to break the dawn and show off that charisma, uniqueness, nerve, and talent. Logan, though, still wearing the granny outfit from the attempted romantic lying, ends up running into his now ex girlfriend at this point, Camille, the acting lady from that previous episode who has a little flirty moment with Logan, despite the breakup, because these guys kind of give off the vibe of being long term in the show. And I also guess the whole him dressing up as a granny for reasons that Camille doesn't know is something that isn't a problem for Camille. <laughs> well, you even look cute as a Grammy. <laughs> Why, thank you, dearie. Or is at least normal enough for Logan that she doesn't question him doing it, so... Hashtag ally? Logan then runs into a random girl named Peggy, played by Carson Young from Scream. Ah, 
I knew I recognised her, as well as an episode of Emily in Paris, but the less said about that show, the better, am I right? Without basic bitches like me, you wouldn't be fashionable. Peggy mistakes Logan for a grandma because he's dressed like a grandma and because of her eye issues she needs glasses to see, and Logan continues the ruse of pretending to be a grandma to convince Peggy to meet the grandma's grandson, Logan. I just moved in yesterday. Oh, well, you should meet my grandson, Logan! <laughs> I can see you two have a lot in common! Pretty skeevy stuff, especially for a guy who then proceeds to whack two dudes with a handbag because they check Peggy out for what is literally the same thing that Logan is himself doing. Like, all the guys in that situation are being creepy, Logan more so. I don't know, don't check out random women with long stairs and don't trick a woman to thinking you're a grandma so you can tell her to meet up with your grandson. And you might think that that was the last we'll see of Grandma Logan. Like, obviously, now real Logan, without drag on, gets to meet Peggy, and the narrative continues. The question of, ooh, is Logan gonna go with Peggy? Or are we gonna explore these Camille things later down the line? Okay, so I'll catch you guys later. And yet, guess what happens? Logan is back in Grandma Drag at Camille's door, to her non-existent surprise. Seems that Logan is dressing up as the grandma character so that he can check in on Camille and make sure that her and Logan are doing well, and what avoidant bullshit is this? Like, damn, men will pretend to be old women to avoid having a conversation about their feelings, am I right? Oh, well, I just came back to see if you and Logan were doing okay and that you're still good friends. And he does also seem to kind of enjoy doing it, despite the fact that yes, the joke is a little bit on the whole guy dressing up as a woman thing, but at least the character is having fun with the cross-dressing gender fucky stuff. Like, this is a guy who's enjoying himself, despite the targeted and directed laughter of the audience towards the actions that he is engaging in, as a direct contradiction to the expected gender norms that men must abide by. We have our next episode of Big Time Songwriters, Season 2, Episode 12, a mere two episodes later, when the Big Time Rush boys have to figure out themselves how to write a hit single, because the new songwriters hate each other and fought till they ended up in hospital. Mario's hospital! No, we're going to St. Luigi's! You smell like sausage! No, you smell like cabbage! With all the Usual hijinks and singing that one has come to expect from Big Time Rush by this point. As well as Logan dressing up as a girl again, as you've come to expect from Big Time Rush. So, what does he do this time, and, and why? Well, let me tell you, dear viewer, and do my job of explaining things, I guess. I mean, I, I do get paid to do this, I suppose, by my Patreons, no less. The people who help to fund all these videos that are on the channel, that allow me to do this in the capacity that I currently do, and that, hey, you know, if, if you want to join them and be the main sponsor for me making videos, then check the links below and click on through to that. Yeah, yeah that was some really sneaky guerrilla marketing for my Patreon there. No way anybody clicked that was what I was doing. Anyways, the boys split up into two songwriting groups. Kendall and Carlos with their song Oh, and James and Logan with their song Yeah, leading to a disagreement that ultimately turns to violent musical instrument usage. Violence that for some reason doesn't include violins. An obvious joke that I feel the big time rush writers really missed out on not including. Our important part of all this, though, is that James dresses Logan up as a girl so that he can successfully flirt with her in the creation of his lyrics. Like, he needs a girl to target so he can figure them out. Usually great with words. Yeah, when you talk to girls. And seriously? That was the gut instinct of the group here, and, and Logan seemed to at least be perfectly comfortable with the idea enough that he went along with it and did it. I mean, you know, Logan's bopping along to the song, is sort of getting a little bit into it, even if he does seem to find this whole dressing up as a girl to get hit on by his bandmate and friend a little bit weird, especially because presumably they could just go and find a girl to do all this, like, 
doesn't have to be Logan, right? It's odd that James is like, well, it's gotta be Logan. No one else could possibly pull this off. Anyways, that's all that happens in this episode. It's just another case of Logan having a different girl's outfit, like I mentioned on hand, and a different wig to wear. They end up putting the two songs together to create the hit that is... Well, the hit that's a very boy band song. And this was actually a song that was on their debut album, BTR. An album that hit number three on the Billboard 200 and was promoted by them playing a bunch of concerts at high schools. God, what a crazy year 2010 was. You win. You guys right, win. We're we going to go. do another song we'll right play now. another song. I think I'm deaf now. Oh, you guys are excited about that one. And it's sort of ridiculous because this whole Nickelodeon gambit paid off. They made a ton of money from this band slash TV show that targeted children with songs like Boyfriend featuring Snoop Dogg in that era when he was just doing whatever features people would pay him to do. I mean, Big Time Rush was certainly no Hannah Montana or High School Musical in regards to popularity, but shit, you can't compete with that sort of Disney star power and money presence. Nobody can. And I certainly don't think they were helped by being a boy band at the same time when One Direction existed and was super popular. But to tangent this tangent with another tangent and hopefully something more episode related, the end of this episode is still wild. The music executive dude listens to the song, decides he too wants to collaborate with Gustav, finds out the collaboration was done through violence, gets his assistants to rip off his sleeve, and then slams the producer man into the recording glass. Ah! Ah! Oh! Holy shit, what a fucking end scene to go out on. Who the hell is this executive dude? And why is he just like looking for any excuse to beat the shit out of the music producer guy? And he's also jacked. He came with sleeves prepped to rip. That's a man ready for violence or one who is on his way to a WWE debut. And I think we know what the answer was here. Both. I want to be thorough. Uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Finally though, we come to the final thing I want to talk about. The final point to make. And I lied. I lied earlier. When I said this was going to be nice and simple, just one character, four episodes, bam, we're done. I lied when I said that Logan was the only one dressing up like a girl. We just focused on Logan so that I could lure- Oi. We just focused on Logan so that I could lure you in, so I could deceive you, much like the boys use cross-dressing as deception, because all of them dress up as women multiple times. I'm not joking though. Kendall dresses up as a woman to avoid the paparazzi during season 2's episode 6, Big Time Sneakers. A frankly insane plan because I feel like a pop star dressing up as a girl is only going to get more media attention than the whole finding out that this actress isn't actually dating her co-star like her publicist wants, but Kendall instead. Also, quick aside, the guy Jet here, the one who is fake dating Joe for the publicist, is a person you need to remember. He's an attractive dude who's a douchebag, but he's like a douchebag who's like kind of friendly with the gang a little bit and helps him out sometimes. And you need to remember them because they are going to crop up as another cross-dressing guy in a different episode we're going to discuss. I know, there are so many. The forced feminization is getting out of control in Big Time Rush. Every guy dresses up as a woman. All of you get to dress up as a woman. You're dressing up as a woman. You're dressing up as a woman. You're dressing up as a woman. Carlos in Big Time Pranks dresses up as a girl to trick the Jennifers into trying lipstick that was actually glue, which is kind of a fucked up thing to do, but by the by, it works because Carlos wears a whole ass girl mask and also apparently can rearrange his body form to really pass in a way that is kind of freakish. <laughs> we warned 
imagine this would get ugly. Is Carlos some kind of Kalidus Temple assassin or something? There's a reference that at least one Warhammer 40k fan was not expecting to find in a big time Rush Geniswap video, I bet ya. But here we are, and there you are, Warhammer 40k fan. I see you. You tried Rogue Trader yet? It's a pretty good game. Owlcat though, bit buggy, but it is what it is. But also, Carlos dresses as a girl for big time cameo too which features the big time Rush boys on the big screen, having a, well, having a cameo as the name might suggest on a made up show, while also getting their own real world cameos with Yo Gabba Gabba of all people. Hell yeah, my Yo Gabba Gabba guys. It's never any fun by myself. I love to share with my friends. And also, uh, Scott Bayo as well, which is, um, Suddenly, oof, one of those only got worse as time passed, though maybe we should have taken the hint that Scott Bayo campaigned for Ronald Reagan and was at his funeral as a sign that he absolutely was on track to become a racist, conspiracy theory retweeting piece of shit. Regardless, the thing we care about, the cross-dressing thing, is gonna have to take a backseat for a second to the weirder thing in this episode, which is the fact that the show writers decided to use it to poke fun at show writers who write kids shows, literally inserting a bunch of writers into the episode who are trying to make the big time Rush boys look like one note idiots? Makes James look self-centered, Carlos look like an idiot, Logan look like a science nerd. Who would watch that? Uh... And making jokes about how show writers for kids shows are stupid. Here's the thing, guys. You all literally do what you're poking fun at that show for doing. It's not parody if you have it be exactly the same as the reality. Like, all of these are exactly what Big Time Rush is. The joke is less funny and more of a really harsh look at the truth behind the kids' TV industry writing. But anyway, back to the gender swap shit that we actually care about, and then there's the reason we are here in the first place, and... Nope, I can't do it. We need to talk about the evil stepmother who is stopping Carlos from making out with the chick of the episode. Make a date with Beauty before the beast comes in. No! We, we, we... I, I tried to move past it, but I can't move past the magical floating stepmother who controls the beautiful princess and stops boys from talking to her or using her kiss chip. And if I decide to let her have a boyfriend or use her kiss chip, I control Dara. I tell her who to kiss. Seriously, how can I not at least mention that, you know? The, the, the train at this point is so far off track that I, I'm, I'm afraid the ghost train is coming to get me. You know, the ghost train, the spooky ghost train. Legitimately, the ghost train from Thomas Tank Engine actually gave me nightmares when I was younger. Okay, I need to breathe and calm down. We're getting too excited here. Okay, there we go. Much cooler, much more calm, collected put together. Anyway, the thing we need to get to is actually all the way at the end of the episode, and that bit about the writers mocking themselves does come into play here, as Big Time Rush, the band, are talking about how if they had their own show, they wouldn't have silly, cheesy gags. They wouldn't dress up in costumes just to get a cheap laugh out of the audience. A comment which immediately cuts to them getting into an elevator dressed up as a cowboy, an astronaut, an Abraham Lincoln, and Carlos dressed up as a woman, baby. It's not our style. Dumb. Now, my amazement at the fact that he admits it. He admits it. The man in a dress thing, they just admitted it is a cheap joke used for shock value and audience mockery. Something that I don't think it's better that they acknowledge that that's what they're using it for. It just kind of continues the bad taste I have of a show knowing that what they are doing is shit and sucks, but still doing it anyway. Like, mocking your show for being bad is okay if you're, like, improving. But if you're mocking it for being bad and it's just bad, that's not mockery, that's just truth. It loses the charm of feeling like they are giving it their best shot. No longer are they giving it their all, their big time everything. They seem to be aware of the flaws and not changing them. But 
all of that opinion stuff, all of that commentary is immediately cut off for me by fucking Lucas Cruikshank or Fred Figglehorn turning up as a surprise cameo in this episode. Hey guys, great to see you! Hey Lucas! What the darn two in hell are we in here? Some kind of Quinton Reviews video? Are we? Am I? Help! Let me- <laughs> And finally, 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 actually, we have James, who dresses up as a girl in big time prom, thanks to a series of shenanigans involving a Kristen Stewart parody and Camille slash Logan dealing with the same romantic shit they deal with all season two long, to the chagrin of fans that I include myself in now, because I've watched the whole bloody thing and I kind of think I liked it. God help me, I kind of think I liked Big Time Rush despite everything I've said about it. Big Time Rush walked for me so that Riverdale could run as far as I'm concerned. And no, I won't explain what I mean by that. If you've watched both of them, you'd understand. In case you haven't noticed, I'm weird. I'm a weirdo. I don't fit in. James is sneaking away with Logan, wearing a full-ass dress for reasons, and the spotlight directed by Gustavo ends up landing on Logan and James, which means that they get declared prom king and queen to the slow realisation and horror of Gustavo and his assistant, but to the claps and general okayness of the rest of the crowd in what is frankly a pretty reassuring manner. Logan and James! Like, none of the people here have any issues with what has happened, nobody speaks up to call out the fact that James is getting to be prom queen as admittedly Jamie, but I mean they all kind of know you know. Yet the funny is still that this guy was visually dressed as a girl, and that he desperately wanted to be prom king only to end up getting something a little different. James does have another episode as well though, this one featuring that Jack guy from earlier, remember how I hinted at this? Big time surprise in season 3's episode 6, wherein the guys have to help Kendall out because the girl he wants to date, a different girl, has her shitty douchebag ex beau come back into town. Oh. Now, how do they help out, you might be asking, and the answer is a little bit complicated, but James and Jet specifically are not helping Kendall out because they want to help, they have their own ulterior motives to dealing with Bo. Wow, so many guys with so many ulterior motives in these kids shows. No one's doing things for the right reasons, you know. But the reason they want to do it is because he's hotter than them in their mind and they need to get rid of Bo as the current reigning hot guys of the Palm Springs Hotel. Cause that's the best looking guy at the Palm Woods ever. What? I gotta get rid of the hot new guy? Do I mean nothing? Which is where this whole thing centers around and uh, I now am realising that I haven't mentioned Palm Springs Hotel at all until this point, and maybe I should have shared that at the start of the video. But I didn't get the information out then, uh, you get it now, sorry. There's an actually pretty well written scene in this episode involving the guys with cameras trying to catch Bo cheating, while at the same time Kendall is trying to talk to Lucy about some stuff going on between them, but the elevators are like busted and keep going up and down and opening and closing at inopportune times and pretty rapidly. Oh, wait, 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 door open! Door open! Door open! Door open. Oh no. He's in the elevator with a hot girl! And they're heading downstairs! It's legitimately the funniest thing Big Time Rush has done the entire time I've been watching the show, and I gotta give kudos to its Scooby-Doo-esque hijinks with a slightly different context and setting for them. Very inspired stuff, pretty funny. Regardless though, this whole thing tanks their original plan of using Camille to trick Bo into revealing that he's a sleaze on camera, as he now knows that Camille is friends with Lucy, to which they despair that they don't know any other hot girls who'd be willing to go along with this plan of theirs. How are they going to trick Bo without knowing any other girls? And 
Guys, 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 guys. Logan exists. Come on. Every time you've got a silly plan that requires someone to dress up as a girl, Logan has always been there. Unfortunately, Logan is off doing his own B-plot right now with Carlos and the CEO guy involving uh, kidnapping and forcing a CEO into a recycling bin where they think he got turned into like a bottle and they put the bottle in like a little suit. We recycle Griffin! <laughs> he orders to kidnap him. It will hold up the court of law! So, alas alack, he's a little bit busy right now. And they need to find someone else to take up that mantle of cross-dressing today. Well, it's... it's gonna be James and Jet. We covered that at the start of this paragraph. Th th those are the ones that cross-dressing. I, I said that already. And they do the realization moment plus the musical sting again for this because that is just persistent at this point. Uh. It's become obnoxious how noticeable it is when a show does that. Like, if I see it happen in any show, my mind immediately goes, are we going to cut to some guys being in dresses now? Is that what's going to happen? Like, if it zooms in someone's face and they're going, Ugh, and there's a little doing noise, is it like cross-dressing time? But yeah, James and Jet are now cross-dressing with the classical sexy music playing. It's part of the overall joke this is meant to be, right? That we normally use sexy music for things that are sexy, so using it for this decidedly not sexy thing, which is what guys in dresses are supposed to be, right? That's not a sexy thing, right? Right? Yeah? Not sexy? That's not sexy to see a guy in a dress? Well, it shouldn't be sexy. That's what the straight cis people want you to think. Well, that's meant to emphasize the admittedly sort of transphobic and homophobic at its core physical gag in play. The sexy music's meant to uh, accentuate that. The question here for me is more, do the guys look good in dress? Do they successfully trick Bo? And how does Bo react to this eventual realization that these are guys in dresses that he was hitting on? The first answer is that they actually look the most feminine of all the guys who've been doing drag so far. Like, they're certainly putting Logan to shame. Move over, Logan. Some new cross-dressers in town. Especially Jet, who also seems to be totally cool with doing this and is mostly just checking themselves out in the mirror to make sure that they look smoking. Date her after this. I'm prettier than you. You are not! Camille continues her allyship arc as well by telling the guys that they both look pretty damn hot, you know? And hey, Camille. Thank you for your support. The second answer is that Bo does fall for it and starts responding to their seeming consent by getting very close, very fast, which maybe James and Jet should have fought this far ahead for. We skip the guest list, <laughs> then get to the kiss list. <laughs> oh, great! Like, this guy is a serial cheater who seems to jump on women almost immediately. Maybe should have seen that coming. James and Jet try to pass off the responsibility of kissing Bo for the camera to the other one because someone needs to kiss him to prove to Lucy that he is actually a cheater. Just talking to other women isn't going to cut it after all. To which, right before the kiss happens, because Bo, hey, Bo's happy kissing both of these ladies, you know, Bo will kiss anybody. James punches Bo in the face because, you know, you can't show two men kissing on Nickelodeon in 2012, especially not when one of those guys is in drag. Think of the children. Get enough! The third answer is that Bo doesn't seem to give a shit that he was attracted to two guys in dress. Seriously, Bo is just like, oh, this was your sneaky little plan. I get it, pretty smart stuff there. You, you really had me going for a second, almost, almost caught me. And nary a mention is made from Bo towards the fact that he was into James and Jet, wearing makeup and a dress. Oh, I see. This is your little plan to get Lucy to tell me to leave. Is this weirdly supportive, Bo? He'll cheat with men in dresses that he thinks are girls. Heck, he might even cheat with trans women. I don't know how to feel about that. I, I, I didn't think that Bo was going to respond violently or that he'd like throw slurs out or anything, but I did think he'd be more shocked by the revelation rather than cool as a cucumber about it. 
Odd stuff. The show does get a little dig in here though, with Lucy admitting that Bo is right in that everyone at the Palm Springs is nuts, with the camera jumping to James and Jet in drag, while the music, the goddamn music, not on our side I'll tell you that much, does its little work of giving us audience clues again. Clues about how we should feel laughing at these guys in dress. He is right, everyone here is nuts. That element there is something that I have really noticed. That internally within the show, there is very little transphobia or queerphobia or whatever you want to think of. Like the characters are generally chill with stuff, and actually weirdly pro-people messing with elements of gender. A good message as far as I'm concerned. It's okay to play around with this kind of stuff. It's the external part, the way that the episode is edited with the music and the cuts to imply comedy to us about this stuff, that is designed to have us in the audience laugh at what is happening as silly and something worth ridicule. That's what really makes it veer into the bigotry, homophobia, queerphobia, transphobia stuff. It's the writers, the directors, the creators who are making this a problem via their interpretation of the scenes into comedic material and the way they're doing that. And that's the lot. That's all of it. Well, honestly, it's actually probably not all of it. There are entirely likely to be some random ass entries that I either missed or didn't bother including in my digging through all of this. And yet, I think we have enough here, god I hope we have enough here, to get the picture. A picture that was frankly painted pretty well by that first Logan episode, but that I needed to really hammer home for you lot with how prevalent it is and the way it gets presented. Also, I want to quickly address the fact that there is a huge variable in clip quality during this video, because I wasn't allowed to legally purchase this series on Amazon. Nickelodeon, big time rush, I, I, I tried to pay you guys money, especially for big time prom kings, because all I could find was a 144p resolution clip of the scene that I wanted for that on YouTube. And yet, because I don't have a US address and a card with a US bank account, I couldn't buy them. I could watch the shows, that was fine, but I couldn't purchase them to download them to put the clips in here. So. Please forgive me for doing the best with the limited resources that I had on hand for a show that apparently nobody is uploading video clips or videos for me to use, and I hope that the quality of the videos didn't ruin your viewing experience too much. Now, to the conclusion that we have reached about Big Time Rush, which is that this show had an awful lot of cross-dressing and drag for a show that was also very, very very straight and very, very, very cis. A feature that's actually quite true for a lot of kids media back in this time period, but it has never been this overwhelmingly consistent across all the characters in anything I've seen so far. Even Boy Meets World didn't do cross-dressing this much and this casually, and that did it a lot. People cross-dressed a bunch in Boy Meets World, as you can find in my video about it. Ooh, plugging myself. So, what's the deal with this? Is this just a case that it's the best that the writers could do with inserting queer stuff into the show without it getting shut down by the corporate overlords? Or was it merely just that laughing at guys in dress is a very common trope and theme, and they were lazily inserting it repeatedly to get a laugh out of something that inadvertently ends up mocking trans people and queer people by proxy, that encourages children to think negatively of this by how it is positioned. Well, an answer to that can only really be somewhat discovered by seeing who was running this show, who was writing for it, and who was producing it. We can find some contextual clues within that, which will hopefully help direct our, frankly, ultimately subjective interpretation of this facet. As I literally just mentioned, the problem with the show does sit with the external way in which it is presented, rather than the internal way in which the characters handle situations. There are no trans storylines, there are barely even cross-dressing storylines. Cross-dressing happens as part of other storylines. So this does boil down to who was doing this shit and what can we kind of think they intended. The answer is that the creator was Scott Fellows, 
a guy who made a bunch of Nickelodeon shows back in the day, such as Ned's Declassified and 100 Things to Do Before High School, as well as Johnny Test for Cartoon Network. He also worked on the Fairly Odd Parents movie with Butch Hartman, and I wonder if he had a chat with the guy about gender swap episodes, cause um, they've certainly got some stories to share about that. There are also the producers, Grace Gifford, Joanne Toll, Lazar Sarek, and Deborah Spadell. One of which also doubled as a writer for the episodes in question, Lazar Sarek, who wrote Big Time Break, Big Time Pranks and Big Time Crush. Like, actually digging into it, Lazar Sarek wrote a majority of the cross touching episodes. It was either him or Scott Fellows, with only two Big Time Cameo written by Jed Spingarn and Big Time Songwriters written by Jessica Gao not having their hands all over it. Digging into these people, what I found was an overwhelming lack of real information for Scott Fellows. Like, you find a bunch of random people popping up who I think are not the guy, which means that there wasn't anything noteworthy enough to write specific articles about. I don't know if he's gay or not or anything like that. There's mixed rumours and the only site providing any information even kind of working towards that is one of those shitty, poor-based user interaction sites that looks like it's written by robots about celebrities, so do with that what you will. The more intriguing thing to me was when I jumped on Lazar Sarek's IMDb and saw that he was involved in, firstly, writing a few episodes for Canadian animated series Shazow, and I know that there are a few people in the audience who are in the know that are aware that has some implications, as well as a uh, more pressing reveal, which is that he wrote, produced, and directed a film in 2003 called Killer Drag Queens on Dope, which featured none other than Alexis Arquette, or Eva Destruction as you might know her, a pretty renowned female impersonator actor in the industry, which is literally what she was called a bunch, who was also actually transitioning at the time that this film was being made. Let's ride. A film that she helped to produce. Now, I'm no expert, but it's maybe possible that the guy who wrote a bunch of cross dressing episodes for Big Time Rush, who does perhaps utilize many of the tropes present in media of that time period, tropes that harmfully engage with stereotypes, it is possible that Lazar Sarek, like I said earlier, was putting in merely what they were able to get away with and sneak past corporate censors and those one million mum style groups that come down hard and fast on anything that could be deemed inappropriate for children. Like, yes, it's not good, or perfect, or something we should be okay with now, but coupled with the understanding about one of the writers at least, maybe we can see that this is an attempt to inject some of the fun of drag and cross-dressing and gender fluidity in the only way that they could possibly get it in by. A way that just unfortunately does not hold up to the scrutiny of people who hope for better and want to see mainstream shows for cis people do stuff that isn't so working into the attitudes that they have already built and enabling the very negative opinions that they might have of trans people, crossdressers, or drag queens. Like Killer Drag Queens on Dope, a film that I absolutely will cover at some point now I've found out about it, I'm, I'm absolutely doing something about this, it's a film that utilizes the way in which queer and trans and drag people are often presented in films or shows and parodies that to an extreme as a way of making comedy not of the characters, but of the tropes. Big Time Rush never really succeeds in making its comedy clear that it's laughing at the tropes. All it sort of does is do the tropes and then wallow in them, because it can't commit hard enough. So that's Big Time Rush. I think it is. It all got away from me pretty hard when the amount of cross-dressing episodes expanded from the initial three to four I was expecting to like 
10. Hopefully, some of it made sense to somebody, or at least it was enjoyable to listen to. That's all I can really ask for. If you like what I did here, then consider sharing, subscribing, liking, commenting, big timing, rushing, cross-dressing, dragging, you know, all that good stuff. If you really, really liked it, then you should go to Nickelodeon, set up camp outside their headquarters, and demand that they release a sequel to Big Time Rush in the style of Fuller House or Girl Meets World or Danger Force. It takes a nostalgic hit, maybe, and makes it more queer and more drag. That's the best thing that you can really do to help me out, honestly. Oh, shit, I suppose you could also go to my Patreon or my Ko-Fi, the links are below, and subscribe there. The names of those in the $5 and up category are scrolling past the screen right now, and they really do help to make this whole YouTube video thing a living, where I'm not reliant upon big corporations abusing the system to steal all my income from the videos I make under fair use laws, until I can finally get round to appealing them weeks later after all the big view times have already happened and the money is all gone. Yeah, the whole site is absolutely boning the creators, like me, which is why the Patreon is essential. It means I get paid a steady income that isn't dependent on robots being kind to me or missing my usage of 30 seconds of the show which they're scouring the web for to claim an entire 40 minute video of. So yeah, go check that out and do that if you have the money to spare for it and want to help me keep making videos in the current capacity that I do. Other than all of that, thank you for watching this video, and thank you especially for making it through 10,000 words about Big Time Rush of all fucking things. Like, Jesus Christ, I, I thought this was going to be a short one, honestly. I'm so tired, and I, I'm so hopeful that the next video I deal with is going to be mm, just so much easier to get through, just just a single episode, just a little bit of stuff, a little bit of talky, you know, less surprise episodes that keep adding up and piling up to make my research a nightmare. Anyway, goodbye. Gotta live it big time. Whoa, 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 big man.